Revelation 12, and we're going to look at this entire chapter tonight, looking at uh, some very interesting topics concerning the tribulation period and what will take place here on the earth during that time. Now we have a, a time note or a time denotation here in this chapter in two different places that I think is very important. Uh, first in verse 6, at the end of the verse, it says, They shall feed her for 1,260 days. And then in verse 14, it, describing the same situation, uses a little different time reference, which I think is important to connect. Uh, it says, The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, and she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the present presence of the serpent. Now these two periods of time are the same length of time. It's three and a half years. A time is a year, times is two years, and a half time is a half a year. And then 1,200 or 1,260 days is again three and a half years using a 30-day calendar, which was the Babylonian calendar, uh, the means of measurement of that time. Now, this clearly indicates that this is what takes place from the middle of the tribulation period unto the end. So this takes place starting in the beginning of the, right in the middle of the tribulation period, to the end of that seven-year period of time. That's important, I think, to note because of the things that are described here in this chapter. Now, this chapter covers metaphorically a woman, and we'll look at who that woman is, and the child that she gives birth to. And then we have a war in heaven with a dragon, and then we have war on the earth. So let's get into this chapter, verse 1, chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for her that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, the first thing that I think is important in this chapter is you have to determine who the woman is and who the child is. Now, this is always an interesting task. Whenever you come to metaphorical uh, illustrations such as this, you say, well, my interpretation is good as your inter interpretation. And how do you know that what you believe is correct versus what I believe is correct? Well, the important thing whenever you interpret Scripture is it should be interpreted by other Scriptures. Now, Mary Baker Eddy believed that she was this woman. And she, of course, was the founder of the Christian science uh, cult. Um, the Catholics believe that Mary is this woman. And then others believe that this woman is the church of Jesus Christ. So how do we determine who is right? Or are they, all, are they all wrong? What is the meaning of this person, the woman? Now, 
I think it's very important if you want to determine who the woman is, again, first determine who the child is because that's easy, okay? It's easy to determine that. Now notice it says in verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now is there any other scripture that reveals who that individual is that's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron? Yes, there is. If you turn over with me, hold your finger here and turn over to Revelation chapter 19, 15. The context here is clearly speaking about Jesus and his coming in his, at his second coming. And it says, verse 15, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So pretty clear who this child is. Now, even if you miss that f little phrase, ruling with a rod of iron, you still have to realize that this child was caught up into heaven. There was an ascension into heaven by this child. So after the child was born, there's nothing described about his ministry, just his birth and his ascension into heaven. You, you say to yourself, well, obviously this has to be Jesus. And yes, it is. So then who would bring forth Jesus? Well, in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, it says there, Jesus Christ our Lord was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, who is the seed of David? Well, it's the Jewish people. And the Jewish line that came all the way from Adam through Abraham, through David, to produce Jesus. Now, that gives you a pretty good indication that this woman here is the nation of Israel. Because the nation of Israel, according to the flesh, has brought forth the Son of God, the Messiah. Now, is there any other verses of Scripture that would substantiate that view? Yes. In Isaiah 54, verses 5 and 6, let me read to you. There God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman. A woman. Isn't that interesting? He calls the nation Israel like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. Like a youthful wife when you were refused, says the Lord. And so throughout the scripture you will find that the woman in the Old Testament is the nation Israel. She is described as the wife of Jehovah, metaphorically. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 20, as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, God says, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. So he's referring to the a nation as a whole, that they have dealt treacherously with him like a wife would deal treacherously with her husband. And so, again, these are just two verses. There are many, many more. And so the scripture makes it pretty clear. Now, how about this, this image of the woman clothed with the sun, verse 1, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a garland of 12 stars. Now this really makes it absolutely clear that this is the nation. If you would hold your finger here, turn back with me to Genesis chapter 37. And if you read this whole section, we, which we will not read uh, tonight, just because of its length, 
uh, chapter 37 from the beginning, you will read that Jacob here is in, uh, is describing here the situation that takes place with his 17-year-old son, Joseph. And Joseph was loved by Jacob, his father, more than his brothers. This brought a tremendous source of envy and strife into their family. Then Joseph all of a sudden started to have dreams. And when he told his family the dreams that he had, well, they were not real happy with him. They hated him, it says, even more. Now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve sons of Jacob become the twelve tribes of Israel, the nation Israel. So Jacob and his twelve sons are the beginning of an entire nation. Now notice how Joseph describes his dream here. Read with me from uh, verse 6. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves. Now this is Joseph talking to his brothers and his father and mother. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheave arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheave. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? So this is how they interpreted it. Are you saying that you are going to reign over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream. He didn't, he didn't get it that they were upset with him, so he had another dream and he told him, a, told him another one. But this is the clincher. Verse 9, And he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars, because he was the twelfth star, he was the twelfth sun, bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? So Jacob here interprets this dream that he has, the sun and the moon as being referring to himself and his mother or his wife, and the 11 stars as the other 11 sons that he has. So it is pretty clear here that if you take Scripture to interpret Scripture, you can't really come up with any other idea here. This can't refer to the church. The woman is not the church because the church didn't give birth to Christ. The nation Israel gave birth to Christ according to the seed of David, according to the flesh. And so, really, there's only, I believe, one way you can interpret this, and this is the nation Israel. Now, the second sign that John sees in heaven is this great fiery red dragon. Now, there is only one individual that fits this metaphoric illustration. Would we all agree to that? There's only one guy, and that is Satan himself. Now, if you go down in verse 9, it makes it absolutely clear. The scripture again interprets itself. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So the great dragon is the devil or Satan. So... There's no question here we have Israel as the woman, the dragon is Satan, and there is this conflict between them. Now, notice here it says that Satan drew a third of the stars of heaven, and in, again, in this context, when he says the stars of heaven, this can only refer to the angels that were cast down with him and that fell in his rebellion. Now, how do I get that? 
Well, again, if you go down a little few verses later, it says here in verse 7, War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. And so again, right in the context, we have what this third of the stars refers to. It refers to a third of the angelic beings fell with Satan and he led them in this rebellion and they are now in this great conflict, which we will get to in a minute. In Isaiah 14, 13, it declares there when Satan, Lucifer, says to God, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He is referring to exalting himself above all of the other angelic beings that are there. Again, in the context, very clear. In uh, Matthew 25, verse 41, uh, Jesus said that one day he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And so, clearly, there are a multitude of angelic beings that are and have rebelled with Satan against God. So these individuals are seen in this particular sense. Here, a third of the stars are thrown to the earth, stood before the woman who is ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, biblically, is that what took place? Was there anybody that was trying to kill the child after it was born? Sure, you know the story, Matthew chapter 2. Herod wanted to destroy this child and destroyed all the children from two years old and under in the city of Bethlehem trying to take care of this Christ child or the Messiah whom he feared. Now it's interesting here, the point of this whole text here is to show this conflict between Israel and Satan. Now this, I believe, is very important because there is this battle that is going on. It describes here as soon as the child is born, but it also describes this as taking place during the tribulation period. Do you know that from the beginning of time, from the moment man fell and God made a promise that from the seed of the woman in Genesis 3, it says that that individual would crush him, would crush the head of the serpent. Now, knowing that, what would Satan's response be? Well, I'm going to crush the seed of this woman. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do everything in my power to destroy this prophecy and keep it from coming to pass. And so if you look at history from the beginning of time unto the present, that is what is going on in the world. If you look at history, you will see that what did Pharaoh try and do? He tried to destroy every male child. What would that in effect do? that would destroy and cause this prophecy to fail. But the Jews did not yield. The Assyrians tried to destroy the Jews. The Babylonians tried to destroy the Jews. The Greeks tried to destroy the Jews. The Romans tried to destroy the Jews. And then all the way up to our present era, in the 20th century, what did Hitler try to do? He tried to destroy and exterminate every single Jew on this planet. And one day during the tribulation period, that whole scenario will happen all over again, only worse. It will only be worse. And except the Lord put his mark upon 144,000 to protect them, they would all be destroyed. So think about this for a minute. 
this guy has got a battle going on with the nation Israel. Do you see that that is the reason why all these things have happened to the Jews? Why all of this is taking place even in our present day today? If we make one remark about the Prophet Muhammad, anybody makes any disparaging remark, I mean, people die around the world. But when the Arabs make statements about Christians and draw cartoons and derogatory cartoons about Christians or about Jews, I don't know whether any of you have ever seen any of those in some of the newspapers that when that whole scene came down here a few months ago with all of the people that were killed over cartoons around the world because the Arabs were so uptight, so upset. And so there's a total double standard going on today in our world. And all I can say is that it is satanically inspired. All of it is satanically inspired. And if you understand that, then you will, you will look a little closer, you will listen a little more intently to what is actually going on. And so a worse persecution for the Jews is yet to come than has been in the past. That is clearly declared here in this text because he protects, they are only saved because he protects them in this wilderness place. And we'll look at this in our last section of this chapter in just a moment. Now also, before we go on from this, at the end of verse 3, it says this fiery dragon has seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. Again, I will refer uh, this particular explanation to our next study next week in chapter 13, where the same reference is used, and I'll explain it uh, to you in great detail there. Now, verse 7. Here's the second section of this particular chapter. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But, notice this, they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because, why? He knows that he has a short time. Now this reveals to you, this, this last verse here, verse 12, reveals that Satan has very clear knowledge and understanding of what his end is. He is deceived. He is literally, I mean, he just is not thinking straight. But he knows. He knows exactly what is coming. Remember one of the demons, they said, don't cast us into the abyss. Don't do that before our time you see, they know what's coming. They all know what is the ultimate end. And so there is tremendous knowledge there. But notice Satan is cast out of heaven after this great battle between Michael and his angels. Now the scripture does not tell us what causes this battle. And it just tells us that he loses the battle. And Michael and his angels throw him out of heaven. 
at the direction of God the Father. Now, that I think is an important truth. Because one of the great misconceptions, I think, that people have today is that somehow Satan is trapped in hell somewhere. You know, you, you see these, you know, I see these cartoons, you know, they come on Mickey Mouse and, and Donald Duck and they show these pictures of people in hell and the devil is down there with his pitchfork and his tail and, and you know, just being consumed in flames. That's just not true. He is the prince of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is, he's going all over the place. And he has access to heaven itself, as referred to here in verse 10, because he is there standing in the presence of God, accusing the brethren day and night. Now one commentator speculated and he said, somehow God is just finished with this whole scene of this, all these accusations. He's just done with it. I'm up to here with it. You're out of here. I don't know whether that, that's a pretty good speculation. But the scripture doesn't tell us, so all we could do is speculate. But for some reason, God says, your time and your opportunity of coming here into the presence of God is done. You're, it's, this is finished. Also, a good biblical example that shows that he has access into heaven is Job chapters 1 and 2. There, in both of those chapters, it is clear that Satan comes and accuses Job in front of God. And so that scene in Job has continued up until this particular time. And then God says, enough. Now, notice that from this point forward, he is restricted now from heaven. Now, you remember in a previous study here in our look at the book of Revelation, I shared with you that this is one of five casting downs of Satan. And that is very important to have all five of these laid out for you in your mind. Let me remind you once again, briefly. The first casting down or casting out was from his privileged position in heaven when he rebelled against God, Isaiah 14. The second casting down was at the cross. Uh, the scripture tells us that now is the prince of this world cast down. And so then Jesus was crucified and he spoiled his principalities and powers and his authority over you and me. We are free from his control. And then thirdly, he is cast out of heaven at this particular juncture in the middle of the tribulation period here in chapter 12. Fourth, he is cast again into the pit the bottomless pit, which we will get to later here in the book of Revelation. And then fifth, he is finally at the end of the millennial period cast into the lake of fire for ever and ever. And so these are the five casting down of Satan. Very important to understand that. Now verses 10 through 12, I think are just fabulous. I love these verses. Notice, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now, who is this that makes this declaration? We are not told. But someone here just cries out in rejoicing, in victory, in just acknowledging the fact that now it's all coming down. Everything that we have hoped for, prayed for, and believed for is now going to come to pass because he just got kicked out of heaven forever. 
He's, he has no access here any longer. Now, it's interesting here. I believe personally that this is one of the redeemed in heaven. I don't know who it would be, but it's one of the redeemed. How do I, why do I believe that? Well, notice, it says, it says right in the middle of verse 10, for the accuser of our brethren, our brethren. Isn't that interesting? So this has to be someone who had been accused. And this individual acknowledges this. This is a redeemed individual who had been accused by Satan himself, and now he knows it will be no more. Now, that is a, a neat blessing, I think. Now, notice the weapons that overcome the enemy. Now, this is truly important. This redeemed individual says that all the people that are there in heaven, they overcame him. How? These are the three things that he lists. These three, three things are incredibly important for you. The first is the blood of the Lamb. Why is the blood of the Lamb something that overcomes the wicked one? How does the blood of the Lamb overcome him? How does the blood of the Lamb applied in your life overcome him? Well, it's very simple. It says in 1 John 1, 7, it says there, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Not some sin, not most of the sin, all sin. Now, this is what enables you to overcome him, that you're cleansed by the blood of of the Lamb. If you are not cleansed, what would your life be like? You would be controlled by condemnation and guilt and the power of your own sin, and you would be overcome. Correct? Because that's the life we lived before we came to Christ. We were overcome. We weren't overcoming anybody. We weren't overcoming Satan, that's for sure. He had overcome us. And the only time and the only way that someone ever even begins the overcoming process is it begins with the blood of the Lamb. Applied to your sin. So be thankful for his cleansing blood. Ask him to apply it to you. Do not yield to condemnation and guilt any more in your life. If you do, you are giving place to the devil in your own life. You're giving place to his lies. Yeah, I messed up back there, but you know what? I am not looking backward. I am going forward. I am going in the direction of the king. I'm moving in his direction. And I'm not looking backward. The second weapon that overcame him was the word of their testimony. Now how does the word of their testimony, how does a person's testimony overcome the power of the enemy and the plan of the enemy? Well, it says in Romans 1.16, these words. He declares there, for Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then for the Greek. Now, if the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, you see, how does somebody ever understand that the blood of Christ will cleanse them from all sin? Because somebody communicates that truth in your, their testimony to another person. And then that person is now free, which then defeats the plan of Satan in that person's life. Do you see how important? You speaking up and proclaiming the gospel. It is so essential. 
And every time we are silent, we are really giving place to the devil. Don't be silent. Now, I'm not telling you to be obnoxious, but I am telling you, when you have an opportunity, ask the Holy Spirit to give you boldness. When the disciples in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, when they were persecuted, they went and they fell on their faces before God. They prayed and they said, Lord, you see what they're threatening us with. Enable us to be your testimony, be your witness. And it says the Holy Spirit fell on them and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's what we need. We need the Holy Spirit to speak his word boldly, confidently. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Now, you have a testimony. But do you know that God has a testimony? His testimony is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. His testimony is, who is Christ and what did He do? He was crucified for you. God's testimony is the gospel. It's that simple. It's His testimony that He wants you to communicate along with your testimony. That what did He do in your life? How did He deliver you? Very important. As we win the lost, Satan's plan is defeated. We overcome him. And then thirdly, notice he says here that they overcame him and they did not love their lives to death. Not loving their own lives to death. You see, selfishness is self-defeating. Every time I live for me, I am giving place to the devil and I'm giving place to my own lust, my own will, my own flesh. I am, I am really not fulfilling God's plan and purpose for me. Only when I live selfishly do I defeat the plan of God. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If any man comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so, if you want to defeat the plan of Satan in your own life, deny yourself. If you want to defeat the plan of Satan in your family, deny yourself. Live for Christ. And notice it says here that they did not love their lives to the death. That may be the case. That may be the cost one day. It is for other believers around the world right now. That is not a real possibility for someone here in the United States. But one day it might be. And so we love the Lord more than you love your own life to the death. I pray you will. You can't overcome anyone. You can't overcome the enemy if you're being overcome by your own lust. And so deny yourself and follow him. Selflessness is what defeats him and his purposes. Now, I made note of this in verse 8, and I'll end with this. He says, But they did not prevail in this battle, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now that really is the key to this section of Scripture. He does not win. He does not prevail. When Jesus said to Peter, The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Same message. He's declaring, look, if you trust in me, you confess my name, he will not prevail against you. 
there is an acknowledgement and a testimony. Peter made a testimony. He declared his testimony. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus declared, this is the victory that you obtain when you declare your faith in him. The gates of hell will not prevail against you, the church, or the church as a whole. If you take the whole armor of God, you can stand against him. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. He describes there how you might be able to stand, victoriously stand, against the wiles, the subtlety, the deception of the devil. And so, that's the only way you can do it. You need that armor and so study that portion very, clear, very closely. Now last year, verses 13 through 17, we have this war on earth. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So this is when the real persecution comes down heavy duty on the nation Israel. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood. Now notice, like, that is a simile. This is figurative language here. It's not an actual flood. Like a flood after the woman, that she might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who, kept, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Very important. Now this last section is where this great uh, persecution takes place and how the Lord protects his people during this time. First, again, remember the 144,000 have been sealed in their foreheads. We looked at this earlier in the book of Revelation. These individuals are protected from the destruction of of the enemy and the, the destruction of, of the serpent who wants to destroy them. Plus, he sends them into the wilderness to her place. Now, much speculation has been made about where this place is. Um, you know, some believe that this is the rock city of Petra because there is a passage in uh, Isaiah 16, verses 1 through 4, where God says, let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler, from the executioner is at, is at an end. Devastation ceases, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. And he says, send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness. Selah is the rock city of Petra. Now this is only one possibility. I personally don't think that this is the place. I used to think that this was the place. But you know what? If the scripture tells us where the place is, why doesn't he tell us where the place is here? He just says, to her place. And he just said, and it's a, it's a hidden place. And it's a place where the enemy cannot get at them. And I don't know what place that would be. I don't know how he could be, how could they could be protected in the rock city of Petra because the rock city of Petra is a, is a destroyed uh, ancient city. And I don't know. It just, I used to think it sounded feasible, but today I don't think it sounds very feasible. All I can say to you is there is a place. Because the scripture says there is a place. And that's all I have to know. That's all anybody has to know. She will fly into the wilderness to 
her place, verse 14, very important. And she will be protected there from this flood. Now also the flood, what is this flood? Well, in Psalm 124, verses 1 through 5, let me read to you this psalm and listen to how David describes this flood that comes against him and what this flood is. I think this is a great parallel passage. Psalm 124, verse 1. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, notice, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. You see, David here describes all of the persecution from men as this great flood that unless the Lord had protected them, that it would have swallowed them up. It would have destroyed them. And so I believe this flood here is just, again, it's metaphoric language here to describe this great persecution that comes against them that is kept from them, and he protects them. Now, the Lord can protect them like he protected the two witnesses, remember? For their whole testimony, their whole time while they were here on earth. When their testimony was done, then they were killed. So he doesn't have to really take these 144,000 anywhere in reality. He could protect them in one, one place and just put a hedge about them and nothing could touch them. So it's very possible that that is the way he's going to do it. But when Satan's attack is frustrated on the Jews, what does he do? He turns to those on the earth who have the testimony of Jesus. Now, some of you say, well, wait a minute, Steve. What are these people who have the testimony of Jesus doing here? I mean, if the rapture took place, then we should be out of here. Well, again, that is a total misconception. Because during the tribulation period, multitudes... The scripture says in, in Revelation 6, a multitude which no man could number. Revelation 7, a multitude which no man could number are coming up out of the great tribulation. There are going to be a multitude of people that are going to come to Christ during the tribulation. And those that are still alive, still around at this particular time, are going to be in big trouble. They are going to be put to death for their faith. In Revelation 20, we will see when we get there that the form and method of their destruction is beheading. Now that's kind of interesting. Have any of you heard lately anybody that chooses beheading for their means of killing those that they think are an affront to their religion. Isn't that interesting? Why would that particular means be described in Scripture? Well, we'll get to that when we get there. But notice, these people have come to faith during the tribulation period, most likely as a result of the witness of the two witnesses, the testimony of those two witnesses, when those two witnesses are indestructible and they're proclaiming the gospel, if they're interviewed on CNN, I don't know, or if their testimony can be heard without any loudspeaker or without any television or radio, I don't know. The Lord can use any means he so chooses. There's going to be people that are going to say, you know what? I think I better believe. I think, you know what? I remember, you know, my Uncle Harry, he was telling me about 
come into Christ. And so they will surrender and they will yield. Notice over in chapter 13, verse 7, it says, It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. He's not talking about Jews there. He's talking about Gentiles. And those who believe in the Lord, the saints, those that have come to faith in Christ during the tribulation period and because of the witness and testimony of these two witnesses. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go to him in prayer tonight.